Now, I'll have you know, just for the record, that I don't pick the hymns. <laughs> Somebody else does that, and sometimes we get hymns that we're not really familiar with. But I want you to keep in mind that if it's uncomfortable singing a song that you don't really know, think about the person who's never been in church and how uncomfortable they feel just walking through the door. And so perhaps we can allow ourselves to experience a little bit of unfamiliarity, if nothing else, but to remind us that for some, the life of faith is not familiar to them at all. And perhaps all of us need to get out of our comfort zones and into God's zone instead. That's not the message, that's just a bonus. The scripture this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew from two different places, from Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 5 is the middle of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount where he is describing what it means to seek after the kingdom of God and to become a part of that kingdom. What must one do? And then later in Matthew 16, Jesus is specifically teaching his disciples about what is about to happen to him as he goes to Jerusalem and prepares to endure the agony of the cross and that his disciples should pick up their crosses as well. Hear now these words, first from Matthew 5 and then from Matthew 16. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. And from Matthew 16, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? O Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us. Help us to give up these things that we ought not to have in the first place and replace them with what comes from you so that we can truly be the people of God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So do you have your book yet? Good. Have you started reading it? Good for you. It's an easy read. I know because my wife told me so. <laughs> Deborah's not a big reader and she said, it's good. So with that endorsement, I hope that you are taking the opportunity to read this. We do still have some copies available if you didn't pick yours up. And we do have the groups beginning this week as we talk about giving up something bad for Lent. And have any, has any of you noticed we live in a world that has some bad in it? I mean, if, if anything this past week has reaffirmed this truth that there is bad in our world, that evil exists. And unfortunately, this condition isn't just out there. It can easily be in here, in this room, and even, dare I say, in us. And so that's why it's so important for us as we think about what Jesus is saying when he talks about 
gouging out one's eye if it's causing one to sin. Or cutting off one's arm if it is causing us to sin. Jesus is talking about something drastic. It's radical. And we hope it's hyperbole. We hope it's exaggeration that that Jesus doesn't really mean that if our eye is causing us to sin, that we really should gouge it out, is he? Is God really asking us to take off our hands if they're messing us up? It sounds ridiculous. And yet, think about what happens if you get an infection in your eye, and that infection starts going back in your optic nerve towards your brain, what is the doctor going to suggest you do? Have surgery and lose the eye to save the brain and ultimately to save your life. Why were there so many amputees in the Civil War? Because we couldn't fight gangrene. And when that infection would set in, the only way they knew how to save a person's life was to cut off the gangrene before it spread up and into the heart and killed the person. So we can see it from a physical standpoint that sometimes getting rid of something on us or in us is for our own good. Well, it's true for us spiritually as much as it is for us physically. And that's what Jim Moore is talking about when he says, get rid of those things in your life that prevent you from walking where Jesus would lead you. Get rid of those things in your life that are not Christ-like. And so that's what we're going to be doing during Lent this year. We are going to give up those things that stand in the way of us being who God has called us and equipped us to be. And it has to start with our attitudes. If we aren't thinking and feeling right, we will never be acting right. And so there are three bad attitudes that I would like us to say, God, I don't want this in me anymore. That first one is bitterness. Now, I looked up the definition of bitter. And if one is bitter, there are two ways of looking at this word. One is this way, having a sharp, pungent taste or smell, not sweet. And you see some of those synonyms of bitter, acidic, acrid, tart, sour, biting, acerbic. How many of you remember the candy sweet tarts? Well, I can remember growing up that uh, one of the routines that my parents got us into when I was four or five years old is on a Saturday morning, we would get up, eat breakfast, and then we'd go down to the public library for about an hour And my mom was one who loved books, and I think she instilled in me a love for books, and in part probably from this experience of going to the library and being able to check out books and having books all week long to read. But what I remember is after we got done with the library and got back into the car, if I had been well-behaved, I would be rewarded with a package of sweet tarts. Now, at four and five, I loved those candies. There was just something about that initial sweetness, then giving away to that sour tartness. It was kind of some kind of feel in the mouth. But you know what would happen if I tried to eat too many sweet tarts? My tongue would get raw and it would begin to hurt. And it's because the bitterness was overwhelming my sense of taste. Now think about that in relation to this other way of understanding bitter, of people or their feelings or behavior 
of angry, hurt, or resentful because of one's bad experiences or a sense of unjust treatment. And how if you let something bother you, and you let it keep bothering you, and this bitterness just gets stronger and stronger and stronger, you end up being like some of these synonyms, begrudging, rancorous, spiteful, ill-disposed, churlish. Even just the sound of it doesn't sound good. Churlish, petulant, peevish, having a chip on one's shoulder. If we let this bitterness hold on to us, the bitterness grows and it makes our whole lives as sour and as raw as a sweet tart will make our tongue. And when you think about what happened this week, last Wednesday was Valentine's Day. It was a day of love. As we give to our sweethearts candy and flowers and cards and hearts. And and it's all about this expression of love from one person to another. But something else happened on Valentine's Day that had nothing whatsoever to do with love when a 19-year-old young man took an AK-47 loaded to bear and he goes to his former high school and he starts shooting. It's tragic. It's terrible. And 17 innocent lives were snuffed out and more than a dozen were injured because a young man let the bitterness in his soul become overwhelming. We learned a little bit about this guy's background. He was adopted So we know nothing about his birth parents. And his adoptive father passed away several years ago, and his adoptive mother passed away late last year. And so this young man didn't lose one parent, didn't lose two parents. He's lost four parents. And who knows what other kinds of things were going on into his life that he felt like his life was just full of unjust treatment of experiences that didn't make sense to him and he let that anger that bitterness take root and grow to the point that he was willing to take someone's life my friends bitterness is destructive and we've seen it firsthand we must cut it out of our own souls. Give up bitterness. The second bad attitude is apathy. A lot of times we think of love and hate as being opposites. But in actuality, the opposite of both love and hate is apathy. Apathy is that lack of interest, that lack of enthusiasm, that total disregard or care or concern. Love and hate are both expressions of feeling. Love is the positive expression and hate is the negative expression, but both of them are expressions of a feeling. Apathy is the lack of feeling, the inability to feel anything at all. And boy, does that seem to be coming up more and more in our world. You know, when I was growing up, this idea of a mass shooting in a school, no less, was literally unthinkable because nobody thought of it. But yet in the last 20, 30 years, it seems to have become such a common experience that there are people that no longer feel anything about a tragedy like this. And I think it's the apathy that allows somebody to do something like this. Somebody who doesn't have a care for others is the only kind of person who is capable of shooting like that. Or going to Las Vegas and getting a high-rise hotel room and knocking out the window and shooting at people that are at an outdoor concert down below. 
We see it all around us and we don't seem to know what to do. My friends, the danger is to become apathetic, to have an indifference, to not even care anymore. But Jesus says, we must care. Why is Jesus so concerned about saving the body to lose a part so that it doesn't all go to hell? It's because he cares. Jesus went to the cross willingly because he cared so much. Apathy is the opposite of what Jesus has done. My friends, we must not be apathetic. We must care for one another and for our world. That third bad attitude is discouragement. And you know, I think probably this is the attitude that can get into a church and seep into the church's life and it will just suck the life out of the congregation. I've been in ministry long enough to have experienced this firsthand when there's some kind of new ministry, a new idea that we want to try to adopt, to approach, to to make a difference in people's lives, and we'll get together and we'll talk about it, and people will say, yes, I'm on board with you. But then as soon as the meeting is over and they go out into the parking lot and they have their second meeting, and they start having conversations like, can you believe that that's what the pastor wants to do now? I can't believe that they're asking us to do this or to do that or to do this other thing. It's just, it's ridiculous. And so they start spreading these discouraging words. And what happens to that new ministry when you've got a verbal yes, but an actionable no? It bombs. It doesn't go well. And so what happened to that discouragement that was happening in the margins now suddenly that discouragement has spread throughout the congregation and before you know it people are starting to say well i'm just done and it's perhaps discouragement that leads to apathy and bitterness so the discouragement causes us to not do what god wants us to do Do you notice how this word is put together? It's discouragement. Dis is to take away the courage that leads to movement or action. But when we look at Scripture, all throughout the Scripture, it says over and over and over again, do not be afraid, have courage. Do you know how many times it says that? 365. How many days are there in a year? Do you think it's possible that God is telling us every day, do not be afraid, be of good courage. I am with you. Discouragement is to fall away from what God has promised on a daily basis to give us. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. We might think that is a discouraging statement, especially if we take it literally and we've got these big crosses that we're carrying through. But what Jesus means by that is not to be discouraged because you're carrying this cross, but to be encouraged because Jesus will do it with the disciples Jesus has done it with us, modern-day disciples, and carrying our cross means that we are accepting the willingness and the ability to care. That we don't want our world to go to hell. We want our world to feel heaven breaking through. 
discouragement is sending us to the wrong direction. And my friends, I want us to go up because God has already come down to get us there. So are you with me? To get rid of the discouragement, to get rid of the apathy, to get rid of the bitterness and let God encourage us to love and to be God's people. We will be blessed. Are you ready? Let's make it happen. In the name of Jesus, amen. My friends, as you go out into the world, you're going to be hit on every side by things that will discourage you, things that will make you feel a temptation to be bitter about it, and might even cause you to want to say, I don't care anymore, and just become apathetic. Don't let it happen. Let the love of God flow through you and around you so that you can help others to see how God loves us. And may we be God's people. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.